وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Indeed, all the praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him. We seek refuge in Allah. We seek forgiveness from the evil of our deeds and from the evil of our souls. Whomsoever Allah ta'ala guides to Al Islam, none can lead him astray. And whomsoever Allah ta'ala calls to go astray, there is no guide for him. I bear witness that nothing has the right to be worshipped except Allah. He's alone, he has no partner, and I also bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is his servant and his messenger. Firstly, I would like to thank the brothers, the administration, all the brothers and sisters at Masjid Taqwa who organized this tremendous event. May Allah Ta'ala bless you, may Allah Ta'ala preserve you. May Allah Ta'ala ta place this on your scales and good deeds on your Muqiyama. For indeed, this is tremendous. This is tremendous, Allah. And secondly, I'd like to thank all the brothers who came out, who came from far places, Jersey, Philly, Long Island, Brooklyn. May Allah Ta'ala bless your brothers for even coming out and attending this event. I was asked to speak about the safety and security of the Muslim community. As this right here plays a very important role amongst the Muslims. Islam, as we all know, came to preserve the blood, the wealth, the honor of the people, especially the Muslims. It came to preserve this. And these are one of the things that Allah Taala commands in the Quran. He commands with the preservation of life, blood, honor, wealth. And this all is within the boundaries of safety and security of the believers. Allah Tabarqa Ta'ala, He says in the Quran, Ya Yuhaladina Amanu Sbiru, Wasabiru, Warabitu, Wattakullah Allah Kutufiru. Allah Ta'ala, He says, O you who believe, as He is addressing the people of Iman. Isbiru wa sabiru, meaning be patient and cautious and patience upon patience. Wa sabiru wa rabitu. And this kalima, this word rabit, is a person who takes God on the frontier. Wa taqullah ala alakum tuflihun. And fear Allah so that you may be from amongst those who are successful. This command and other commands that we have in the Quran to take God in the frontier, meaning to take precaution, to be ready, to be haras, yani, to be observant and watchful and security minded. It's a command from Allah Taala. And the ulama, they say that a person who's rabid falls into one of two categories, the general and the specific. The general and the specific. The general is for everybody. thing he mentioned was to take steps towards the masajid, to increase your steps towards the masajid. The An authentic hadith, the Prophet says, no, to every step that you take towards the posts that I've seen, 
most of your brothers indulge in. But I've seen most of your brothers, and I've learned from most of your brothers, and I've watched most of your brothers, if not all of your brothers, God, the believers, from when I was a young child. And I know there's a lot of y'all in here, and I'm not your age. I'm much younger than y'all. I've watched y'all. I've watched y'all protect the believers, to protect the massages, pull security. May Allah Ta'ala bless you, for indeed this right here will go on your scales on your mudiyah. I've seen this with my own eyes. Myself, my brother, we've seen this. The second is God in this frontier. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned this. And he mentioned a hadith, which is authentic, collected by Imam al and Imam Ahmed, which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he explains the rewards for a person who does this. Al-Ribat Khairun Min Siyami Shahrin Wa Qiyamihi the Prophet said, the person who guards the frontier for the believers is better than praying an entire month. Night prayers and fasting an entire month. And we, of course, we're talking about the optional fast and the optional prayers. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he went on, he said, whoever dies doing this deed, this tremendous righteous deed, then he will continuously get the rewards that he would consistently do until Yom al If a person dies doing this. Why is this so important? Because we know the Prophet Sallallahu he said, mata ibn Adam in amaluhu illa thalath. He said, when the son of Adam dies, all of his good deeds stop. All of them except for three. However, when a person who's guarding the frontier, this his deeds are continuous until Yom al Qiyamah that he would normally do. This is tremendous. So guarding the frontier, meaning giving safety and security in the Muslim community, has a precedence in Islam. It is very important. And it is not something insignificant. And on the time of the Prophet Sallallahu you had some people who came to visit him. And the Prophet was there from the beginning that was all for sale. And after they ate, they became sick. So the Prophet them directed them to a man who had. And this man, he told them to go and drink the milk from this camel. So he directed them to it. And when they went and they drank the milk, what did they do? They turned to renegades. They went and they killed this man and took his camel. Now, these people who did this, Allah wa ta'ala sent down a special ayah for them. As what did they do? They caused a type of fear and panic in the Muslim community. They cause fear and panic. People who cause fear and panic amongst the Muslims, Allah Taala had given these individuals a special type of punishment. Allah Taala He says, "Inna ma jazaa al-ladhina yuharibun Allah wa Rasoola wa yasgoona fi al-ardi fasada an yuqatiluhu aw yusallibuhu aw taqta'a aydihim wa arujulihim min khilaf." Allah Ta'ala, he says, indeed, those who wage war against Allah and his Nabi, we see this, for the people who cause panic amongst the believers, Allah Ta'ala describes them first and foremost as people who wages war against Allah and his messenger, because there is no place for making the Muslims scared. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, for those who even enter the masajid, make sure your arrows are covered so that you don't accidentally poke someone, right? Never aim your weapon towards another believer. The safety and the security of the believer should always be maintained and protected, always. There is no such thing as a Muslim putting his hand on another Muslim or threatening another Muslim because the blood and the honor and the wealth of another Muslim is sacred. Indeed the reward 
or the punishment for those who wage war against Allah and His Nabi, that they should be killed or they should be their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite ends. Or they should be expelled from the land. The Prophet wasallam, he sent the Sahaba to get these individuals. And once the Sahaba, they caught these individuals, he brought, they brought them back to the Prophet wasallam, And what did he do? The Prophet wasallam, ordered the companions to take their eyes out. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ordered them to cut off their hands and their feet from opposite angles. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them to put them in the desert so they can die. This was the reward for all the punishment for those individuals who cause fear in the land of the believers. Brothers and sisters in Al-Islam, this is very important, which our brothers do, which our brothers have done. May Allah Ta'ala bless all of you and continue to bless you and open up an avenue so the Shabab like myself and my sons and my nephews can come up and guard the frontier of the believers because this is very important. This is very, very important. And one of the ways we need to do this, my brothers and sisters, is to establish the brotherhood that we have amongst one another. Like Sheikh Ali, may Allah Ta'ala preserve him, mentioned the brotherhood. The brotherhood is very important. One of the ways to establish the safety and security amongst the Muslims and with the Masajid is to increase our brotherhood. We have to visit one another. We have to give gifts to one another. We have to give salams to one another. And we have to stop this bickering that we have amongst one another. Allah Ta'ala, He mentioned in the Quran, وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْحَبَ رِيحَكُمْ Allah Ta'ala, He says, do not bicker and differ with one another or less or else you will lose. This is pertaining to war. If we fight with one another, we're going to be the losers. And the might that we have, and the awe that we have will be removed from us and our enemies will not fear us. One of the great Imams, Ibn Taymiyyah he said, if the believers were to be together, naam, if they were to be together and they would not bicker and fight and differ amongst one another, then the believers will never lose a war. Never. They will never be the losers. But when we bicker, when we fight, we don't have this brotherhood, this sisterhood that we should have, according to the Quran and the Sunnah, then this right here opens up the door to shaitan to trick us and we're going to be amongst the losers. Nah. So we ask Allah Ta'ala to increase our brotherhood. Another thing that we should do as Islam has a certain type of protocol. There are some people who do security and some people who don't. There are some people who are in charge and some people who are not. Everybody have a place. If we were to refer the affair back to the people who are in charge and the people who have this responsibility, then the people would know what to do. There's a certain type of protocol. And we have to refer this affair back to these people. The one who's the head of security, the imam, the one who has the specialty in this. Allah he says, when there comes an affair pertaining to the safety and security of the people, instead of returning it back to the people who are in charge, they spread it. And when they spread it, they cause a lot of problems. Allah Ta'ala, he says, if they had returned the affair back to the proper people, to the Prophet وسلم, and those who were in charge, they would have known how to investigate, or the proper investigators. They would have investigated properly. If not for the mercy of Allah, many people will follow shaitan. So we see that there's a certain type of protocol, along with brotherhood, and sisterhood, and loving one another, and protocol. These are key factors 
and preserving the safety and the security amongst the believers. And if we do this, and I believe, wallahi, from what I've seen growing up, one of the things that the brothers and the imams, Imam Saraj, uh, Imam Rahim, Imam Alameen, and the other a'imma, they used to always preach brotherhood. I believe their hearts were sincere. I believe their hearts were sincere when they read an ayat and they try to follow the ayat best to the best the way they knew how to understand that ayat. Now, even when they came to giving out lashes. <laughs> yeah, they was following what they knew. <laughs> Some of the brothers ain't laughing because <laughs> they said we still do to give out lashes. <laughs> now, they had that brotherhood. They wanted to do what was pleasing to Allah wa ta'ala. They had a pure heart. We need to keep our hearts pure when dealing with one another. I'm not going to talk long because I can talk very long. And I know the food is here and uh, Imam Isa is here. So I just want to thank the brothers for coming out. I would like to thank your brothers for having me speak for a few minutes. It was an honor for me. Wallahi, it was an honor for me just to come and be in your brother's presence. Thank you. And wallahi, may Allah wa ta'ala continue to bless the community of the Muslims all over. Fi kulli makan wa fi kulli zaman. Ameen. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillah. Jazakal khayr for the imam. Alhamdulillah. Hit on some key points that is necessary. Uh, the key points that is necessary for us to, you know, to reflect, and uh, hopefully, inshallah, that we build on, right? Um, for years, you know, uh, f from Connecticut to to Jersey to Philly, even Virginia, and so forth. You know, we we were really working because we had issues, and those issues we had had addressed with the drugs and things of that nature. We got the call from Jersey, the problems they were having in, uh, Philly, in, in uh, uh, Virginia, in Connecticut, in, in Long Island, and we responded. So we got to get back into that mode, and this, I think this is the beginning of that, inshallah. You know, we've have, you, you can see we haven't lost it. We earned for it. We yearn for it, inshallah. So without any further ado, I want uh, Imam Isa, everybody is familiar with Imam Isa from Long Island, from Masjid Taha. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد عبد رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد uh, brothers and sisters if you notice I came basically with the security vibe I'm wearing a vest I got some brothers with me that's wearing a vest um, and that is to try to get everyone into the same mindset and understanding what time it is and beginning to realize that although the Muslims have not surfaced as the main subject of what's going on in this country, <coughs> eventually and ultimately, inshallah, basically that is what is going to take place. So I wanted to talk very very uh, briefly about three aspects that I think we should be concerned with. The first aspect is what we call movement. And the second aspect are the people who are part of the movement. And the third aspect is the system of the people that are part of the movement. When we speak about movement, Movement begins with a vision. And in that vision, there's an ideology. And that ideology also has a methodology. And the ideology and the methodology begins to define the goals and the objectives of the movement. 
And once you understand the goals and objectives of the movement, then from there you transfer that vision or that ideology to a blueprint. And that blueprint can come in the form of a proposal or it can come in the form of a policy. And just like when you're building a house, you know, you have a vision of the house and then you transfer the vision of the house into a blueprint. And then once the blueprint has been established, then you begin to seek the resources that you need in order to bring about the people must turn from disobedience to obedience. Those people who have left the deen, if they want to come back into the deen of Allah subhanahu wa the intention alone is not sufficient. They must turn from disobedience to obedience. And once we've done that as a people, as individuals, we turn from disobedience to obedience. Then from there, as individuals, those individuals begin to make up families. And those families begin to make up communities. And those communities begin to evolve into cities. And those cities begin to evolve into states. And the states begin to develop into a Omar or a nation. And so therefore you have what is going with the movement and you have the people of the movement. The third aspect is dealing with the system of the people of the movement. And that system, of course, is the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we speak about the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I reflect upon what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Quran. Blessed is he in whose hands is the muk, the dominion. And he has power over all things. And the word muk also means sovereignty. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his his kingdom is the sovereignty. And anyone who is opposing that sovereignty is in rebellion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so therefore we're talking in reference to the historical references that even what the Christians talk about when they say Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're talking about divine rule as established by a law subhanahu wa that was so delegated to the Prophet as delegated to the Khalifa to Rashid or the Khalifa Rashidun and those who followed them and those who followed them to the last day. Now I started off with that because I believe firmly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen a particular people in this country that have historical experiences, that share historical experiences. And I also believe that for too long, the racism both in Islam and outside of Islam have kept that people down. We talk about a people who was born from a people historically that came into America in chains only to evolve to such a level where they were able to walk into the White House as the first family of the United States of America. When you begin to reflect on that, and I'm not getting into racism, you start to realize that maybe a loss of our dollar has something special for these people. Maybe a loss of our dollar has chosen these people for a special cause. And you see that in the attitude, the historical attitude that these people have gone through. Even after the chains came off, they didn't settle for that. When they were told to go to the back of the bus, they said, no, we're going to the front of the bus. We're not riding on the back of the bus anymore. And it was that attitude that began to launch these people from a position of change all the way to the position where they were running the country. I think that's indicative of the people to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have chosen for a specific cause. And what is that cause? That cause is the establishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen in this country. Years ago, 
I remember when our big fellow son moved it. I remember some of our immigrant brothers that came over and we began to work together. We started networking. And then we had to define our relationship. <coughs> and one of the brothers said to me, he said, well, it's very easy, man. He said that you are the answer and we are the courage. And I had to think about that for a while. Because the whole aspect of the Hidra was there for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was the answer of the call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hudum. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, you know, when the believers are called to the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to his judgment, the judgment of Allah and his messenger, alayhi wa salatu salam, what do they say? We hear and obey. So that the people who were migrating here to America were coming here based on the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were coming here to get a piece of the pie. <laughs> they wanted to get involved in the system. They wanted to become part of the system. So I had to respond to them and I said, you know, respectfully speaking, you got that backwards. You are the answer. And we are the courage. It is we to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to establish the deen, the pure deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this country. And when I say pure deen, I'm talking about government. The best unity, brothers, is based on government. And the best government is that government that was established by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the best government. And you can see it manifesting because this system that's in front of us is falling apart. Right in front of our eyes. The people have lost faith in the system. They've lost faith in the political system. They've lost faith in the economical system. They've lost faith, faith in, the, in the, uh, 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 the, uh, the police system. They don't trust the police anymore. They don't trust the government. They've lost faith in everything. And this is an ideal time for us to bring the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into effect. And the reason why I say that is because these people have been stealing from the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for years. And then they're always talking about the, you know, the discrepancy of the Sharia. I was looking on Fox News not too long ago, they were trying to do the origin of the jury system. And they found out that the jury system was established by Imam Malik in the, I think it was the 8th century, under his jurisprudence. And you should have seen the lady's face. She was sitting there. She said, whoa, whoa, it looks like we owe our jury system to Islamic law. They owe everything to Islamic law. There's a reason why the Quran is sitting right there in Washington, D.C., in the museum, because Thomas Jefferson used that Quran to, to, to take from the system that was established by the laws of Mandal and his messenger, Ali was allowed to select. He took that system. They talked about the check and balance system. That check and balance system was established under the Khalifa of Omar in the 6th century. When he made the Khalifa, he was the executive body. The Quran and the Sunnah was the, was the legislative body. And the, the judicial body were the Muftis and the Qadis who were the ulama. And therefore, if, if, if there was any great period with, you know, where the executive or the Khalifa could not uh, pronounce a, a, a judgment based on the Quran and the Sunnah, then they would go to the ulama. The, 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 uh, at that point, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Khalifa would become a uh, Mushahid, which interpreted the law, and therefore the ulama would step in and they would be the interpreters of the law. It's the same system you have here in this country. Except that the executive body is the president. The judicial body is, 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 the, is Congress. Laws that are made by men. And the, uh, and, or rather I should say, the legislative body is Congress. And the judicial body is the scholars who study the law of Congress. They stole the system from the law upon that. Everything they have done, any benefit that they've done, I'm talking about all Europeans, everybody, have stole from the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They studied the great empires of Islam, all the way from the Prophet of Allah to the Ottoman Empire. They studied those empires and then they stole the system from it 
and then their, in their hypocrisy, they begin to define the Sharia as something that is alien. When the truth of the fact is that they're scared, they know that if the people really knew about this Sharia, if they knew about the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they knew that, that, that this is the system that deals with freedom, justice, and equality, they would leave the system that they have now and they would flee toward the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and crowd. They know that. They're afraid of it. But time is running out. It's running out fast. And these people have gotten so scared that on Facebook, they now have people that have skeletons on Facebook and they're saying that straight up, they're saying, you know, we are the we are the Kufas that your Imam has been telling us about. It's right there on Facebook. You can find it. They got it in the Arabic Kufa. You know, the Hadith for the Prophet said that in the last days that you know we, that everybody would be able to read it, it's right there. Kufa. And basically, they're going to fight all the way down to the line. The enemy is Allah and His Messenger, Ali was salat to salat. I'm telling you. But it's covered up with all this kind of stuff in terms of civil war. That's because the system is falling apart. It's beginning to decay. It's getting ready to move into a state of anarchy. People are going to be running the streets and they're going to be killing each other. But you can believe that the, that the number one enemy that will be that will be focused on will be the Muslims. And so therefore, as I said, I'm not going to talk too long, it becomes imperative that we come together, that we join together, as Imam Mahmoud said, that we join together as a brotherhood. And that brotherhood has to be based on the system that was established by Allah subhanahu wa We should be talking about coming together in the same way they came together in Medina. When they sat down and they established the Medina Treaty, we should be making treaties of defense treaties with one another. So that we understand that all that is lawful and all that is good and all that is lawful according to the Quran and the Sunnah. We should have defense treaties. Already, what we've been doing is establishing a central network system throughout the country. Okay, we have the, we have our, our Wazir, our national Wazir. Is functioning out of uh, Florida, and we have also another aspect of the Wazir that's functioning coming all the way from the West Coast. His mission is that he's the Wazir of defense. His job is to begin to build an army. We should be taking advantage of getting these vests that I'm wearing. We should be taking advantage of getting the head the, the headgear that I'm wearing, because the people who are producing it are in fact our enemies. They try, they they produce these things, getting ready for. And as you know, my book has said, you know, we are obligated and responsible to be ready. For if we do not anticipate, if we do not anticipate what is coming down upon us, then how in the world can we say that we are followers of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who himself was on the battlefield? How can we think that we can be exempted from the battlefield? Jihad is part of the deen. And when they used to say back in the day, the thing was the temptation used to say, war, what is it good for? Well, go into Surah the Anthem. Go into the part where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about war, and he says, if they incline toward the peace, you incline toward the peace. In that ayah, you begin to see that war is there for a purpose. Because peace is obtained in two ways. It's obtained through submission and it's obtained through negotiation. If it's obtained through submission, then you, you follow what Ibn Khaldun said that the language is always tending to take upon the characteristics of the language. So part of your submission is that you take upon the characteristics of, of, of your enemy. So you begin to adopt the system of your enemy, his characteristics, his culture, and everything else. But if you understand the concept of war from negotiation, as the Prophet Islam did, then you realize that by building your army now, building your forces now, strengthening that security, then you find yourself in a position where you're able to negotiate through strength as opposed to weakness. 
And this was the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, When he finally sat down with the Quraysh, he was able to sit down through strength. And that's the position of war. That's why we have to strengthen our ranks. I, you know, again, I'm trying to close out, one of the things that we decided that we were going to do is we wanted to have a sit down in Florida, 2022 in May. We're having a program, my Mahmoud is one of the speakers, you know, Shiraz is one of the speakers. Uh, we have other well-known speakers that will be speaking there. We also have an honorable speaker that's coming in. Some of y'all may, may remember him. Uh, uh, Felipe Luciano, he's coming in to speak specifically about the COINTEL movement. Because a lot of Muslims don't think that the COINTEL program exists. A lot of Muslims don't think that. I mean, I'm amazed at the fact that a lot of Muslims are, are, are surprised at the fact that Imam Jamil is sitting in prison with the truth of truth.